Good afternoon, and welcome to the ATCO Space Lab Speaker Series. My name is Alicia Tropak, and I am the Director of Transformation for ATCO, and I will be your moderator today. This lecture is the second lecture in our Space Lab uh, Speaker Series. Our next lecture is going to be on August 29th. Join us. Joining us then will be Dr. Yu Tang Shi from the University of Alberta. But before we get underway with today's lecture, I would like to remind you that this session is a one way video format, video and audio format. You can see and hear the presenters, but they cannot hear you. We encourage you to ask questions by using the question icon at the right of your screen. We will open up the question function at functionality roughly midway through Dr. Hatton's lecture. Now I would like to introduce Andrea Kleber Langen, Vice President Transformation, who will share some opening remarks and will introduce our speaker. Andrea, over to you. Thanks so much, Alicia. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional territories and the original caretakers of the lands where we make our living and enjoy the abundance of the land with our friends and our families. I am honored to live and work in Treaty 7, the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, Nitsitapi, comprised of the Siksika, the Kainai, and the Bugani Nations, the Susina Nation and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Beresba, Wesley First Nations. The city of Calgary, Mokinstis, is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. I would also like to pay my respects to elders, past and present, in all of the communities and regions where we operate and where we are located today. We are very pleased to have you join us today at our actual Space Lab speaker series. These sessions are a chance for us all to learn and share in knowledge and insights from thought leaders who work, whose work and expertise truly inspires. I'm a proud member of ATCO's transformation team. We are a diverse and collaborative team of curious professionals with backgrounds that include law, engineering, business, physics, other mathematical and material sciences, and design thinking, to name a few. In addition to presenting this speaker series, the transformation team also leads ATCO's Space Lab. Space Lab is an enterprise-wide framework of collaborative support for the creative energy of our colleagues. Space Lab is a source of funding and expertise for any ACO employee wanting to test and achieve sustainable new value for the company and our customers. Today we are joined by Dr. Ross Hatton, who is going to share with us his work in the field of robotics, inspired by patterns of movement in living organisms, and more specifically, spiders and snakes. Dr. Hatton is first going to discuss how geometry can be used to model a machine, person, or animal shape during cyclic movements, such as swimming or crawling. He is also going to speak about the ways in which spiders use vibrations to perceive their environment. The advances in robotics that are resulting from work such as Dr. Hatton's have a direct correlation to ATCO and other companies and how, to, and how we are able and will be able in the future to access and monitor our assets and to work in remote and challenging terrain. Dr. Hatton joins us today from Oregon State University. He received his bachelor's, master's, and PhD degrees from MIT and from Carnegie Mellon and is now an associate professor of robotics and mechanical engineering at Oregon State, where he directs the Laboratory for Robotics and Applied Mechanics. Dr. Hatton and his team work to translate advances in robotics from the lab to commercial applications, something near and dear to our hearts. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Hatton. Uh, thank you again for having me. Uh, as was mentioned in my bio, uh, I started off my academic career at MIT as an undergraduate and then spent my graduate time in Pittsburgh at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, I spent uh, some time in Japan working in a national lab there as part of the National Science Foundation Fellowship. And then for the last decade, I've been at Oregon State University in Corvallis, Oregon. Uh, when I got here, we didn't have a robotics program, but we had big open space. And so part of my uh, work here has been in transforming the space and renovating it and building up the uh, 
uh, robotics uh, lab at Oregon State University, where I am now one of uh, over 10 faculty members working across a range of different robotics areas. My background in robotics, the thing I'm most known for is working on snake robots. And so this was, uh, came out of my time at Carnegie Mellon University, where the lab I was working in uh, had uh, snake robots built as chains of servo motors. And by uh, cyclically moving the uh, joints of those um, snake robots, uh, we can basically use them as a piece of active rope to uh, do things like sidewind, or if we slightly change the pattern, we get motion uh, that uh, is able to grip around a pole and climb up the pole. And so uh, as we, uh, as I've moved forward, I've also started working in soft snake robots. So this is an example of a robot that instead of having a servo motor is uh, built of uh, constrained air bladders uh, out of silicon rubber. And so when we inflate and deflate those bladders, uh, they stretch and bend. And so it's able to uh, crawl through various uh, terrain. I've worked on, um, I've looked at the geometry of seahorses. So I was on a team that was understanding the uh, shape of seahorse um, vertebra and why the uh, and especially I was looking at things like why the there's a bias in the shape of the seahorse uh, uh, seahorse bone structure, uh, which turns out to be because the only bias only shows up if you stretch the seahorse tail out straight. If you look at it uh, relative to its um, natural curled configuration, uh, it's unbiased relative to that natural um, curled configuration. And these are the kinds of insights that I try to look for when I'm working with biologists. Uh, another project that I've started working on recently is uh, more complicated pneumatic uh, snake robots. And so, for instance, this robot here is a uh, inflating bladder snake robot, but instead of simple crawling, we're actually able to make it do a complex sidewinding motion. And uh, this motion is based on the fact that we've constructed the robots so that the individual air bladders wrap helically around the um, core geometry of the snake, such that when we shorten them, it forms a large helix. And then by cycling those helices, we're able then to uh, get a complicated sidewinding motion, uh, which previously could only be achieved by building long chains of servo motors and precisely controlling them relative to each other. But by exploiting the helical geometry of the system, we're able then to, uh, 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 we're, uh, by uh, forcing the helical, by using the helical geometry of the system, uh, we're then able to uh, generate this complicated helical motion without having to do any pre precise coordination because the, uh, uh, because the helical geometry is built into the system itself. Uh, moving forward then, I've worked with uh, colleagues, Professor Jonathan Hurst and student Andy Abate, looking at leg robots. And so Jonathan Hurst has a uh, company that is uh, producing leg robots. And one of the things that uh, they were running into as they were building up their prototypes in the lab before spinning off the company was that they're designed with parallel actuation on the legs, which seems to be a good design for uh, distributing the load evenly across the motors actually turned out to be costing more energy than they expected. And so uh, we were able to go through and uh, look at the geometry of the leg and use the physical geometry of how the, all the links were arranged and how forces traveled through the leg and identify why the uh, geometry that they were using was causing problems and then how to make a better geometry that um, uh, used far less power and was and then found its way into their company's robots. Uh, another project I'm working on recently is uh, the idea of using uh, buckling elastic members in order to generate uh, robot motion. So this is an example here where we have a swimming robot that uses a uh, tape measure uh, in order to generate the geometry of its fins and so is able to uh, get some patterns of motion that we couldn't otherwise get if we were using rigid objects attached to the motors, but we're able to get a uh, very good swimming motion out of the 
um, flexibility and traveling rolling hinge that you get when you bend when you buckle a tape measure. Uh, I'm all, uh, beyond the locomotion side of my work, I also do uh, a fair bit of work with spiders and understanding how uh, vibrations transmit through web-like structures and how information uh, can be carried by those vibrations. Uh, on the educational side of uh, my work, I've been work developing a full stack robotics course designed to take uh, students who come in with a some core engineering knowledge in uh, say one area, say mechanical engineering or electrical engineering or computer science, or maybe don't even come in with core engineering degree. Like they come, uh, for instance, they may come in with a psychology degree if they're going to be working uh, on human robot interaction. But how do we, and then I've been working on the problem of how do we get a baseline in all of the other robotic skills uh, for these students so that they can understand what problems their colleagues are working with and have some understanding of how their work is going to fit in with the requirements of other engineering disciplines. And so to that end, I've been working on a full stack robotics course, uh, which uh, aims to, over the course of one term, uh, familiarize the students with the fundamental robotics paradigms such as arms and cars, understand all of the mechanical, electrical, and computer setup required in the robot, and at least have done a little bit of it. So even if they're not working in that area, they've got some um, uh, hands-on knowledge of what, act what actually goes into these various tasks. Uh, a lot of robotics is programming, and students don't always come in having good programming skills. We look at things like code management and version control. Uh, coding for physical systems, so the need to do offline testing. Uh, and then robot operating systems. Uh, and so as part of that, I've actually written uh, uh, my own uh, piece of code called ROS ROS. So ROS ROS is a the ro robotic operating system. It's a widely used tool for integrating different pieces of a robot. But there's a lot of complicated things behind implementing, uh, behind using it. And so if you want to teach how it works, that's not always the best thing to use. And so I've written a lightweight robot operating system uh, code that uh, uses the publish and subscribe framework that is the core to running a robot, which is the idea that any sensor should be able to publish its data. And then you can take a uh, algorithm or a process or some of it uh, uh, process is going to use that data and pull that data down. And so you should be able to have a um, good interface for passing that data around. And so uh, the full robot operating system takes uh, uh, quite a while to install and configure and set up properly. So for my course, I developed a lightweight version of that graph structure, that uh, architecture for doing flowchart style connections between elements of a robot and put it together. So it's about 300 lines of Python that provides a minimal interface to the multitasking. So that's saying that I want my computer to be doing a couple different things at once or my robot, the computer that's at the heart of my robot, to be reading sensors and making decisions and turning on and off motors. And so uh, that um, my code here that I use for the class uh, applies a uh, minimal implementation of that so students can get familiar with how um, those structures work. And so it does things like being safe for threading, threading where you've got the multiple different things the computer's doing at once. That can be dangerous for programming. So I looked at how do we teach students uh, the basics of how to safely work with it so they can understand the principles. Um, and then uh, the idea is so that they can set up um, computer structures that their robots can, that their sensors can pass data to, and then other structures that they can take a function and they can tell it, read your data from one of these buses and write your data, write your output to another bus. And that avoids having to have functions call each other. They can run themselves in their own loops and then pass the data between these broadcast systems. Sort of like how a weather, uh, and this, this is a widely used paradigm. You can think of it like how uh, for weather satellites, it doesn't go through and ask the satellite for data every time uh, a user goes in. If you had uh, everyone in the country going through and asking the satellite for data all the time, it would overload and crash. So it has a clock cycle where it pulls data from uh, one, uh, where it pulls data from the satellite at regular interval and then asks and hands any user their most recent data. And so this is a very fundamental paradigm in robotics. And so uh, this material that I developed for the course is a way of 
uh, getting to the heart of how that works as quickly as possible with as little coding overhead uh, as, uh, as, as I can manage. And so as if in the court uh, over the uh, class, I have the students actually implement this. And so they learn some of the programming thought that went into these tools that are used by roboticists every day and that they learn some of the history of how we got to this current state of technology. And then uh, it's also available then as a lightweight prototyping framework uh, for going for, uh, forward with other classes. Uh, on the research end, uh, going back to the core things that I'm known for, a big piece of that is understanding the geometry of locomotion. And so from my aspect, uh, from my perspective, the geometry of locomotion starts off with the idea that we have an area perimeter problem in which net displacement we can think of as being related to an area in the configuration space that, uh, that the system explores. And uh, to make that concrete, let's say that I've got this three link system. It's uh, swimming in a fluid. And uh, as it oscillates its joints, it swims itself forward. And I can actually tell you from the mathematically from the model that that system moved itself forward because it encircled a sign definite region on a function of the dynamics. And I'll talk a little bit more about that function as we go further in the talk. The second principle is that the cost of motion is perimeter based, which means that the longer the path in the space, the, lo uh, the longer it takes to, com to complete. And this means that, <clears throat> uh, and so this means that if I want to go as fast as possible for a given effort, I actually want to follow this red path that doesn't maximize how far I go in per, per cycle, but allows me to complete the path faster. And so in this case, it's about 75% of the time for 85% of the displacement. And so if I run this uh, red cycle for a long time, I actually have a more effective motion than if I were to run the gray cycle. You can think of that like uh, taking very long lunge steps on the gray cycle versus taking an easy stride on the red cycle. And by using these mathematical tools, I'm able to visualize directly um, what the optimal cycles are going to look like. Uh, we've got various extensions, so we can extend this to things like shape spaces, where I have more than three, uh, where I have more than two joints. So I have high dimensional uh, problem space in which to try to find the best motion. And we can also do this in a data driven form where I don't necessarily know the model, but I can learn the model. And because I have some expectation of uh, from the geometry of similar systems of how the model should look, I can actually do more effective machine learning on the system. So uh, going through a little bit deeper dive into the way I uh, geometrically view the world. Uh, we can think of locomotion problems where I've got something crawling like a snake. A minimal example of that could be this three link system where I have two joints. And then I can put some constraints on the system that tell me what my allowable combinations of my motion in the world and my motion in my shape, so my joint angle velocities, what, um, what allowable combinations I can get under those constraints. And so for instance, if I were to put roller skate wheels on those three links, then I could say that uh, I'm saying that the wheels are not allowed to slip sideways. And that means that my constraints say that I'm only allowed to have position velocities and shape velocities that end up with those uh, wheels not moving sideways. If I'm uh, free falling or I'm in a uh, fluid like water that's very heavy compared to its viscosity, then I can do, uh, say that if I start at rest, my momentum has to be zero at all times. And so then I'm only allowed for, uh, to have motions where my body and shape velocities have some sense of zero momentum. If I'm swimming in a viscous fluid, so uh, this would be like a person swimming in honey or molasses or a very small object swimming in water where the viscosity becomes dominant at very small scales, I can say that I need to, I can only swim at uh, with motion, I can only have motions where my forces all balance out because everything very quickly goes to terminal velocity. And so I can write down some math that says that my, I'm constrained to only moving uh, with velocities at which I'm at terminal velocity. Once I have that kind of uh, constraint model, I can divide it into the portion that uh, applies to the position, uh, the omega g, and the portion that applies to the shape, omega alpha. 
And so I can then take that um, take that constraint and I can split it up by moving all of the position constraints onto one side of the equation and all of the shape constraints onto the other side of the equation. I can invert the position constraint and then that gives me a uh, mapping that looks like what we call it in robotics a Jacobian. So that's a something that tells me if I know what my shape velocity is, what is the position velocity that is consistent with those constraints? And so then once I have that, I can I can use this um, structure as a tool for visualizing what happens in my uh, uh, what what happens in my locomotion by saying that each row of that A uh, matrix is going to be a uh, vector field that is a function of the uh, of where I am in my shape space. And what that tells me then is that I can look at the uh, path that I'm following in my shape space and everywhere that I am going along one of those vector fields, I'm correspondingly moving forward in uh, forward in that direction. So I have a forward motion and a backward motion, and then I have a uh, sideways motion when I'm over in these pieces, and then I'm turning uh, possibly so counterclockwise or negatively clockwise as I go with or against the rotation field. And this tells me something about what's happening instantaneously. But if I want to know what's going to happen uh, in the, uh, if I want to know what's going to happen as a net motion, I need to apply some tools about looking at the net motion over a cycle. And the principles that we looked at there are non-conservativity, which says that if I roll forward with a big uh, with a wheel at a large radius, I move for, uh, forward, and if I shrink down and I roll backward. So forward at a large radius, shrink down, roll the other direction at a small radius. I move backward less and then I grow back to my original radius. That system then is going to have had a net forward motion. Uh, it's in its original orientation. It's at original size, but it's had a net forward motion. And I can mathematically see that by saying that if I had one of those vector fields like I just showed recently, uh, that was a motion along the vector field at a large, uh, uh, where the vector field is large, and then shrinking down is moving across the vector field, and then uh, going backwards, that's uh, moving against the field while it's small, and then growing back up again, that's moving to uh, uh, going across the field, returning to its original uh, radius. And so that gave me that net forward motion, which I can see as being the difference between moving forward at a large field value and backward at a small field value. And so that difference there corresponds to three, uh, a couple of things. It corresponds to the uh, slope of the vector field, so how rapidly the vector field changes across the space, how what the span of the change was. So the slope times the span tells me how big the arrows are on the left hand side versus the right hand side. And then the span I uh, travel in the direction of the vector field tells me how much I take advantage of that difference. And so that tells me that my net forward motion is equal to the product of those two spans. So it's the area of that uh, square multiplied by the slope tells me how far forward I go. And we can generalize that uh, to fields that aren't just constant fields, and maybe to and also then to paths that are not just simple rectangles, by saying that uh, the instead of the slope, we're looking at a derivative that's the curl. So any, anyone who saw uh, curl in the calculus class, this is what curl was about. It's saying how big is that vector field? Uh, how much is the vector field changing in directions that matter when I make a closed loop, and that. Uh, rectangle then becomes an area integral of that curl. The second thing that uh, can happen to allow me to get net displacement out of a cycle is that we can have non-commutative effects. And so uh, this is probably most familiar in the sense of parallel parking a car. If I drive the car forward, turn it back up, and then turn it the other direction, I get uh, to a first order, I get net sideways motion whose distance is proportional to how far forward and back I went, 
and how much of an arc I turn through. And so if we look at that geometrically, that's saying that I move forward along an X, uh, uh, X field here, and then I turned and I moved back, um, backwards along the X field and then turned again. In this case, the forward motion corresponds to my span in that uh, in the, along the forward direction. My turning corresponds to my span in the um, uh, in the other direction, and so then I end up with an area integral of what's called a Lie bracket, which says which talks about it's an operator that tells me how much does turning affect what direction my forward motion is in. So in this case, how much does turning here mean that I go backward at an angle versus going straight? And when we pull this together, this gives us something called a curvature displacement formula, where uh, we end up with the uh, net displacement is a combination of the curl effect. So how much forward minus how much backward did I go? This leap bracket effect, which is how much parallel parking did I get? And then some higher order terms that show up because I made some linear approximations in the first two steps. Uh, under certain conditions, we can drop those higher order terms. And so then therefore we can say that our net displacement over that cycle corresponds to these curl and leap bracket or parallel parking terms, uh, which uh, mathematically they uh, these describe a kind of curvature of the of the system dynamics. And so that turns out to be what's important when I want to know what kind of cycles are good for going forward. If we bring that over to our swimming system, we uh, can plot those uh, curvature terms as three scalar values, one for X, one for Y, and one for theta. And then when I execute uh, a cycle, for instance here, sinusoidally oscillating the joints, uh, we see that I get an encirclement of the center of the space, which is sine definite for X. So that means that I'm going to get, uh, my integral is going to be uh, uh, have that positive in this case, because I'm going um, negatively around the circle. So it means I move forward, but I'm enclosing equal uh, positive and negative regions on the Y and theta fields, so I can expect not to go forward and not to go sideways and only to have that net, uh, to not to go si uh, sideways and not to turn, and therefore only to have that net forward motion. Once we have this uh, basic um, relationship between uh, turning, and, between a uh, gate motion and the area integral and how far forward we go, uh, we can start to make some strong statements about the performance capabilities of the system. So for instance, we can expect the system uh, as I increase the gate size from small gates to larger gates, so this is taking like bigger strides, that I'm going to get quadratically increasing displacement per cycle because I'm in quadratically increasing area and approximately constant um, curl in that region. So I can go through and I can expect increasing net displacement. But when I go to larger gate cycles, I'm going to start enclosing some positive regions and some uh, that counteract these negative regions. And so I'm going to get a diminishing returns and eventually I'm going to actually hit a peak for how far I can go per cycle. I also know that there are uh, motions that are not simple sinusoidal oscillations, but are instead more complicated motions that allow me to go further than any of these uh, simple uh, sinusoidal oscillation circle cycles because they're able to dodge the positive regions and so I can uh, do better than any of the individual uh, circles because any circle either has to give up some ne a negative region or uh, include some positive region. So then the next piece here is that we can say that the cost of motion is perimeter based. And so the perimeter cost of motion uh, comes in the idea that we have the range of motion is your deformation speed. It takes longer at any effort to make a large motion than to make a small motion. Uh, so you get deformation speed times time. And so instantaneous effort corresponds to deformation speed. Moving fast is harder than moving slow. And so that means that we can then fix the instantaneous effort and expect that as we increase the range of motion, we're going to have an increasing time to complete that cycle. 
Uh, we can then weight that by noting that certain motions are harder, like this motion there is a lot harder than this motion here because the top motion with the black arrow, uh, that was going to, uh, that involves pushing the link sideways um, through whatever surrounding fluid or across the ground more than the red arrow does. So the black arrow uh, is harder to follow. So it's going to, you have to move more slowly at any given power. And that ends up meaning that you're, uh, you distort your shape space uh, so that your true distances look something more uh, like they do on this plot here than doing a simple grid. Uh, there's also then finer details like cost weighting. So for instance, uh, moving while um, at a very, uh, very curled up is easier than moving when you're closer to straight. And that ends up meaning that your true geometry is again is uh, curved like this, and so that you end up with um, a looking at your uh, path length on a curved surface uh, when you're measuring your costs, and that your time uh, relative to uh, the radius of your motion, so the amount of joint, uh, the range of, that you sweep your joints through, that ends up going uh, slightly sublinearly because it becomes easier to move as you get uh, to higher joint angles. So now we say that locomotion is an area perimeter problem. So that means that we end up with a surface tension like cost saying that it uh, gates, uh, that there's a when you optimize your gates for efficient motion or fast motion, uh, there's a there's a encouragement to make small small motions, but then there's also an outward pressure that says uh, you want to go as far as possible per cycle. So there's a balance then between trying to go as far as possible per cycle and uh, trying to minimize how long it takes you to complete each cycle. And this is similar to the um, calculation you make when you're deciding how to walk across the room. Uh, if you were only trying to maximize how far you go per step, you would take big long lunges, but those take a long time to complete. Uh, so you end up going through and taking more easy strides uh, where then you can complete more quickly without, um, uh, uh, and then so you can get most of the distance of a lunge with a stride, but you can do it at far less time. And when you, we do all of this in computation, we can actually, uh, Write, those, write equations down that act like a soap bubble equation uh, where you're looking at how the surface tension of the soap bubble uh, converges on a balance between that pressure and te surface tension. Uh, we're balancing out our net displacement versus our time to execute the cycle. And if we look at that, that means that if we match the effort uh, put into the system, so it's how fast the red and gray dots are moving, uh, we're able to find at that equilibrium point a gate that takes uh, only 75% of the time to complete the maximum displacement cycle, but uh, gets about 85% of the net displacement. Uh, so some extensions of this idea, we can look at shape spaces uh, with more dimensions. So you end up looking at things where instead of an area integral, you start looking at trying to make a wire that catches much flux. So you can imagine making a sail and trying to orient it so that you end up with uh, as much wind going into the sail as possible. And then we've uh, built all of these uh, tools, uh, these mathematical tools into a user interface that we can go through and when we start looking at a new system we can uh, just plug in the basic geometry of the system tell it which physics model to use and we can get all of these uh, plots called up very quickly so at this point now i'm going to uh, move from snakes to spiders and uh, start and uh, over the last 10 years uh, as i started my faculty position I uh, got very interested in how vibrations through spider webs are going to uh, transmit information to spiders. And so spiders, uh, in many cases, uh, are uh, especially those that build orb webs, cl the classic spider web, are almost blind. And so as you can see in this uh, video here, uh, the spider actually came close to the fly but didn't find it and so backed off and felt uh, vibrations through the web until it could localize where that um, fly was and then come out uh, and come directly out and find it. And so th there's a lot of information that's uh, traveling through the web. Uh, you can think of it almost like a sonar problem, uh, but with the web dynamics uh, creating different dynamics than uh, typical solid material or fluid material.
And so the idea that spiders use information from their webs is very well known, shows up in literature and is a metaphor in many uh, places. But uh, until recently, there's not uh, some of the details of how this vibration uh, transmission and sensing works have not been well known. And so the basic idea, uh, the problem that we're looking at is that the um, uh, when you have a fly trapped in the web, it shakes the web and vibrations travel through the web and the spider feels those vibrations at its feet. Uh, it's able to somehow synthesize the information it's getting from those vibrations and then I uh, use that information to decide where the fly is and then go to the fly. And so experiments from uh, my colleague uh, Damien Elias at Berkeley uh, have shown that it's not possible just uh, in all cases just to look at the amplitude of vibration that's coming into the different feet and make a determination of where the signal is coming from. For example, if, when he excited a uh, spider web over at this location, he found that there were uh, certain strands where there's small motion and then larger motion further away on an angular measure than uh, the small motion was on the excitement. So there's resonances happening in the web. Uh, you can get different amounts of vibration traveling to different locations. And so, uh, and so we started working on uh, how do we understand these vibration pieces? And so a couple of things we've looked at. One is uh, how do we actually measure the uh, vibration in a web. And so uh, the video I just showed with the measurements that was taken painstakingly by applying a laser uh, beam and aiming a laser beam at different strands in the web and looking at the motion at those different points. But uh, it turns out that that's very hard and very time intensive and very finicky experiments. So uh, in particular, if the um, web strand is moving sideways, like this, you lose contact with the laser beam. Uh, you're not going to get a good reflection. And then beyond that, the um, uh, getting a good reflection, spider web itself is not a very good reflecting material. So you often have to put little tags or reflective material into the web, which changes its dynamics. And the spider web is very sensitive um, to those changes. And so you can lose a lot of the dynamics as you put th uh, the different uh, material as you um, when you put this reflective material into the web. So one thing we've been working on is looking at using high speed video to do vibration measurements instead of using uh, lasers. And so the idea here is that rather than trying to look at one point in the web and track its motion, if we take video and we have something that's moving across the video, uh, we get this, uh, there's, it's always somewhere in that uh, pixel space. Uh, it's always somewhere there. And so uh, if you can actually go through and you can actually uh, look at comparative uh, pixels um, uh, at, in time, you can actually pull off, pull out that there was motion from one uh, one pixel to another pixel in time, rather than putting a marker and trying to determine where the marker was at each uh, point. And so this is a technique uh, called uh, Eulerian video processing that was uh, developed uh, about 10 years ago uh, at an MIT uh, lab doing uh, for visual processing. And we've adopted this for understanding how spider webs are moving because uh, we can take that kind of processing and if we detect that there's a motion like this that's oscillating back and forth between two pixels, we can actually say that there's vibration happening at that interface between those pixels. And so it didn't matter uh, where, so, we, so we're able to post hoc determine where uh, we're looking for vibration. We don't have to keep a laser focused on a very fine target uh, through all of the motion. And so as we when we've done that, we've been able to uh, look at uh, vibrations of spider webs under air puffs and to start seeing that at certain frequencies, uh, there, there is a uh, strong filtration for, for the direction of vibration. Uh, that's where we're um, seeing vibration come back to the hub for the spider to sense. Uh, and we're able to get this whole web motion as opposed to choosing only a few spots and painstakingly taking measurements at those spots and trying to correlate the data across experiments. We're able to look at the whole web in uh, one shot using these techniques. Uh, more recently, we've done some of our own new developments in this technology using two cameras in order to uh, get some stereo vision. 
and we're able to take uh, then 3D vibration measurements of these spider webs. And in particular, we're looking at uh, some, doing some work with the um, California Table Grape Association and the United States Department of Agriculture, the USDA, in order to understand uh, black widow ecology because uh, black widows are endemic to the California vineyards and can be, uh, cause a, a bio, um, bio um, hazard problem, bio, um, contamination problem when they are harvested with table grapes and then shipped uh, and, and then shipped with the table grapes to various markets and uh, show up either on people's kitchen tables, at which point the local news uh, um, uh, gets into it and no one buys grapes in the market for two weeks. Or if you ship it to somewhere like Japan or uh, England that doesn't have a native black widow population, you run, run the risk of introducing invasive species. And then even in the US, uh, there's some talk that um, Connecticut now has a black widow population because of uh, grapes shipped from elsewhere. So we're looking at um, some pieces of ecology and understanding how the spiders communicate with each other and what we can do in order to influence that communication to maybe scare the spiders out of the grapes. And using our video vibrometry techniques, uh, we've started to find, uh, say, handshake signals that the spiders use when they're establishing communication with, with each other. And we were actually able to find uh, certain motions, for instance, the cir red circled small blip between the three large blips in the spider signal that were missed by the um, laser vibrometry where we had to put in extra heavy reflect, uh, reflective material. By avoiding that reflective material, we're able to find these small finer, uh, finer blips in the spider signal. And so we're able to get a better handle on what kind of uh, information is being communicated between the spiders. And uh, to wrap up my talk, uh, a second spider uh, inspired piece that we've um, come out of my research is the spider harp. Now, we originally started building the spider harp before we had the video vibrometry techniques because we wanted something uh, to test our vibration models of spider webs that uh, was less sensitive to uh, that was on a larger scale, so we could put measure, better measurement uh, devices on it and be able to better understand how the vibrations <clears throat> uh, were traveling through the strings in order to verify our models. And so we built up uh, this, um, about a four foot diameter spider web. I wanted uh, to make it eight feet being the appropriate size for a spider related project, but that was a little bit too big for the lab. So four feet uh, uh, turned out to be a better um, size to work with. And uh, we instrumented it. We've got a set of load cells. So those are basically digital scales with uh, tuning pegs on them so we can uh, uh, set the tension in the web uh, with ratchets in order to uh, wind it up. Uh, we have accelerometers that we put on the web so we, uh, because it's a large enough scale that those accelerometers are light enough not to disturb the web vibration. Uh, we built a uh, signal generator out of the subwoofer in order to uh, do frequency response analysis on the web motion. And uh, we were able to demonstrate that it, uh, its basic properties, we were able to find resonant frequencies. So here's the second resonant frequency of the web. And then we built started building spiders in order to uh, hold those accelerometers. And these were various designs we tried uh, where the goal was to have a central body that acts like an inertial anchor for, uh, to hold in place while the uh, legs attached to the web vibrate around it. We tried various different means of making the legs elastic. Uh, we had some uh, piano wire. We had some linkages with elastic cord. Uh, we had 3D printed, and, but eventually we decided that 3D printed flexures uh, were the, uh, and symbol beams uh, were the most effective. And so this is our final spider design. Uh, we have a, um, each leg has an alligator clip for attaching to the web. And then there's an accelerometer, uh, basic hobby uh, accelerometer for measuring the motion. And then a uh, central block of washers at the center so that the body stays roughly in place while the legs flex around it. And then we attach that into the spider web so that the uh, we can then attach <clears throat> so that we can then uh, attach the 
uh, basically use the accelerometers as contact microphones in order to measure the vibration at different points in the web. And at this point, once the base, we had the basic technology in place, we started looking at um, how do we use the information that's coming into those feet in order to identify where in the web uh, vibrations are being applied. And as we looked at our dynamic analysis of the web structure, uh, we noticed some features that turned out to be very useful for giving us a robust means of estimating where vibrations are introduced to the web. And so the basic property here is that if we look at a frequency response of all of the different feet on the spider, uh, there's some interesting features. So first, uh, there is a uh, the first resonance, and we'll say that that's a low uh, the low frequency for the region that we're looking at is if we shake the web at uh, a certain frequency, all the feet move up and down together. If we go to a slightly higher frequency, however, the interesting uh, pattern appears, which is that uh, the um, the web seems to vibrate around the foot closest to the vibration source. And so there's a node there, there's a very low frequency response. That frequency is filtered out by the foot closest to the source. As we go to a higher frequency, then the uh, uh, then we can see that the node walks its way around the web so that it's now the second foot, uh, the foot uh, next to the source foot that is and it has the frequency drop out. And if we bump up the frequency even higher, we find that there's a node at the third foot. And if we push the frequency up uh, very high, then we get a uh, very large uh, resonant uh, motion where there's some distinction between the feet that are close and far to the foot first uh, to, to the source versus the feet that are sideways to the source, but there's so much motion happening there that it's hard to distinguish um, any, any real uh, difference between the feet. And this kind of vibration pattern we saw there again matches up with some of the things we saw in uh, Professor Elias's uh, initial measurements, which is that you can have small motion that's uh, close to the source and large motion that's further away from the source, depending on uh, the frequency at which your input is being applied. Uh, and so what you could, you could go through then and take this frequency response and uh, say, well, OK, now I can process it. I can look for which foot has the um, low, uh, which, which foot has a low frequency uh, dropout, which foot has a high frequency, uh, medium frequency dropout, which foot has a high frequency dropout, and then use that in order to determine which foot uh, you're looking at. But that turns out to take a lot of time and not to be a very robust algorithm. Instead, uh, what we found is that uh, if you look at the all of the feet and not just the feet going around halfway around the web, that you get a pairing of the dropouts so that the feet that are both one, um, one strand away from the source vibration, those are going to have very similar frequency dropouts. And uh, likewise, the feet that are a little bit further away and these are not exactly the same because uh, we build the webs as spirals, and so there's a slight uh, asymmetry to the webs, but they're close enough to being this I ideal geometric uh, concentric rings that we see those frequency dropouts at about the same frequency. So it's a, a, almost as if you're having a um, playing a chord to the web, and this foot is missing a note. These two feet are both missing the same note. These two feet are both missing the same note. And so, uh, and if we look at that on the actual physical web vibration, we see that uh, we get a very similar pattern. We, we, uh, this predicted pattern of those paired frequency dropouts uh, were, um, shows up very cleanly in the physical web. So that means that we can correlate, we can look at the correlation between the different feet vibration, um, and we can figure out which uh, pairs of feet are the most correlated, and then use that as a means of determining what direction the vibration source is coming from. And so you can think of this almost being like uh, when they film the Matrix uh, to do the shots where the uh, actor is frozen in place and they um, rotate the camera around. They took lots of shots of the actor at the same time and then used computer processing to virtually rotate the camera. 
here it's like uh, if you think about your ears, you have um, when you look at the sound, uh, you're uh, when you look for the source of the sound, you're trying to balance the sound on two ears. We are uh, we have eight ears on the web and we're digitally rotating our pairings around until we find the direction that best lines up with our, um, uh, that gives us the best um, pairing between uh, feet that are mirrored around the source. And then we can do some front back things. The foot that's um, close has a different frequency response than the foot that's further away. And then if we want distance, we tune all of the um, orange strands to be the same tension such that if we look at a um, long, if we look at the vibration at different um, uh, strands, the long strand further away has a lower sound than the middle strand, which has a lower sound than the um, short strand that's uh, closer in. So we're able to use that uh, pitch of the sound going through the web in order to determine where the uh, vibration is coming from. And um, using that uh, information, we're then able to build an algorithm that uh, is able to, uh, when you plug the web, we're able to process uh, both direction and range. And then in this case, we visualize that by setting up a rotating light bar so it can point at where my student Andrew uh, is plucking the web and uh, then also indicate how far away the pluck is. Once we had that working, uh, I started uh, a collaboration with a uh, professor, uh, electrical engineering professor with a strong music background. Uh, so we could pipe the locations of those puck strings to, to notes. And use this as a musical instrument, which we took uh, in 2019 to the Georgia Tech New Musical Instrument Competition. Uh, and then uh, we're, fi we're, we're we're finalists for uh, for the and took part in the finalist performance. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for uh, being here and we have to take any uh, questions. Wonderful, Dr. Hatton. Thank you so much for uh, this presentation. Um, it's quite, quite fascinating. Um, we will, like you have said, uh, we'll dive right into our Q&A session. Uh, just a reminder to those um, online that you can use the question icon to ask your questions. Um, it will be moderated. so. So um, once the questions are published, you can see them and you can upvote the questions as you like. And we'll do our best to select a broad range of questions. Um, our first question actually that's getting the most votes, Dr. Hatton, is do you offer the one term full stack robotics skills course online? Uh, I do not yet offer it online. That's something I am uh, I'm, I'm looking at doing. I have the um, I have the material for the uh, Ross Ross operating system course that is uh, all up online on GitHub. And I'm looking at publishing the course manual. Uh, it's a very it's very much of a uh, set of tasks that the when I teach the class, it's a um, work, every, everyone working in parallel through a set of uh, exercises. So I think it would be uh, fairly straightforward to put together an online version as a work at your own pace and 
then uh, find other people to uh, to work at the same time. I do not yet have all of that material published online. Thank you. Um, the next question that received quite a bit of votes is uh, through the course of your research, have you found motion patterns that are optimal but not yet observed in nature? Or do you find that the nature has done a pretty good job of optimizing movement patterns? I think uh, nature in general has done a good job of optimizing patterns. The big question that comes in is when we start building artificial systems, uh, they're not going to be exactly the same uh, mechanics and cost structure as we see in the natural systems. And so the key question becomes uh, not so much, and this is the difference, one of the differences between what's called uh, bioinspiration and biomimicry. So biomimicry is trying to build things that exactly copy nature. Bioinspiration uh, then is when we uh, try to look and say, well, that natural system is doing something good, it's doing something useful. How do I harness the same physics in order to build something that uh, is also good and useful? And when, when you're doing bioinspiration, uh, there's a big uh, question about how do we transfer what's happening? So I might look at an animal and say, I presume that there's some amount of optimality, not always the case because there, there's lots of competing things for what the animal has to be doing, but I presume it's optimizing something. How can I identify what physics is optimizing, what those principles are, and then how do they apply to my robots? And so uh, hitting that loop there is where um, actually figuring out what might be being optimized is a whole problem on its own. And then how do we bring how do we bring that over? So um, typically, I, I don't think I've found any generally new optimizations that aren't seen out in nature, but I think understanding why they're optimal and how they work is the uh, is, is a key piece of research to be done in that area. Thank you. The next question uh, likely came from our colleagues in electric. Um, would this snake type motion enable climbing on tall structures like electric poles? to take up a few monitoring repair activities where human safety is a concern and robots can come to, in to help? I think the technology is not quite there yet, uh, but that's being one of the long-term goals. I actually have a project I'm working on right now with a um, uh, collaboration uh, with some researchers at Carnegie Mellon looking to solve what I think is the next big uh, hurdle in that process, which is that the Pole climbing on its own works uh, fairly well if you've got a straight pole. Uh, crossing T-junctions and things like that, where you have got where you have to get around an obstacle on the pole, is a little bit harder. People, uh, uh, the If the pole changes diameter, that's well solved, but getting around a T-junction or a cross-junction uh, is more difficult. But I actually have an active research pro project on that right now. Wonderful. We'd like to... Uh to monitor that. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So our, our next question um, comes from our chief transformation officer, George, um, and he says, fascinating presentation, Dr. Hatton. With respect to the spider web as a communication medium, do spiders rely on a certain consistency in the geometry of the webs they spin to interpret vibrations accurately, or do they have the ability to learn to interpret webs with varied ge geometries? So uh, let's see, so I think for a couple of things. So for some of the communication type pieces, uh, when you're starting to send like a signal through the web, the I think the geometry probably matters a little bit less. If you're sending pulse signals uh, through the web, things are going to vibrate, and so you get a little bit of dispersion. Uh, they probably uh, learn some pieces for that. I think for something like an orb web. Uh, where the, the classic um, spir spiral web. I think the geometry there matters uh, quite a bit. If you, um, and there's a video I've, see, I've seen of a spider building uh, a web, and as it goes through, it's using most of its legs to carefully pre-tension pieces of the, strain, uh, of, the, of the web that are already in place. So it can pre-tension them, attach another uh, a new strand, and then let things go, and have it all stretched back into a, uh, so it relaxes into a desired tension. And certainly with, with our web, uh, we found that tension control and making sure there's balanced tension and um, geometric symmetry around the web is important for being able to do those sonar-like effects. 
Uh, and so we've actually done some similar things with our web of uh, when we build it, we build it um, with uh, we build it Slack, but with very precise uh, distances between the node points. So, so when we stretch it out, uh, we get an appropriate tension balance there. And that seems to be very important for accurate localization of the signals. Thank you. So one of our moderators was wondering if there is anything about the locomotion of something like a snake that is inherently more complicated than human bipedal motion, or does it just seem that way because that's the motion we're used to? And by extension, is there a straightforward measure of complexity when it comes to comparing two different locomotion styles? Let's see, I'll answer the second piece there. I don't know of any good straightforward uh, scale on which I would compare the complexity. So the um, the 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 difference, the, but I would say that there's a definitely a qualitative difference uh, since I've, wor I've worked in both bipedal uh, locomotion and snake locomotion. And so with the bipedal locomotion, uh, the challenges co uh, come a lot in managing uh, balance and contact. So balance, uh, in addition to moving forward uh, with a um, uh, with a human style walker, you also need to uh, balance the fact that you're in, in, excuse me, that you're in contact and then not in contact. As your physics change uh, in, in, uh, with discrete changes in that contact um, versus the um, uh, versus when you're looking at a snake, the complexity comes in in that you have um, contact distributed across the whole body. And so that continuously, that uh, large distributed contact means that there are, uh, in some sense, more things to pay attention to at once with how the physics work, as opposed to uh, bipedal walking where you just have a couple of feet in contact. Uh, and so a number of the geometric tools that I work on as the bread and butter of my research are about how do we manage that complexity and provide uh, good abstractions that allow us to uh, look at the big picture without having to look at the individual pieces. Uh, I guess with the snake locomotion, you also have, uh, uh, depending on how many motors you build in, you've got lots of different flexibility points. And so uh, that's not something where you can have someone um, like control the individual knobs and the motors. And so you need some level of abstraction that can uh, uh, that can handle the um, handle breaking down the continuous sinusoidal motion into a couple of, param of parameters that you can work with and you can think about how those interact with each other. Thank you. So we've got about uh, just three more questions and I think we have enough time. So um, I will, uh, the next question Dr. Hatton is, could similar techniques be used to perceive through non-web materials and structures or is there something unique about them? I think similar material, similar procedures can and have been used. Uh, so in some sense with our the spider web that we built, uh, you can think of that as being uh, like a sonar net where we have a um, where we have a number of different receivers and we're comparing uh, we're, we're comparing the signal that we receive at each of that each of them. Uh, the big difference between, let's say, a sonar net and what we're and what we built here is a sonar net um, can make use of the time difference between signals coming in, and the vibration transmission speeds across spider webs, both natural spider webs and ours, are fast enough that time of flight differences between the different um, between when, when I sense it on one, uh, so like on, on a human ear, I can tell uh, some direction by I hear a sound over here, it hits one ear before it hits the other ear. Uh, these uh, transmission through the spider web on the scales we're looking at is so fast that that's an unreliable comparison. And so we've been using uh, filtration knockout uh, dropout points uh, in order to do the localization. Uh, that I think those could quite well work in say a membrane. Uh, you can think of the spider web as being a membrane with a uh, material property that is um, very anisotropic. So there's no material stiffness as you go from one strand to the next and high material stiffness as you go uh, along a strand. And so um, I think we could you could apply the same kind of uh, filtering based uh, localization to vibrations traveling through a solid surface, but I have uh, not yet pursued that.
Thank you. Um, the locomotion treatment seems to require that the position constraint be invertible. I mm -hmm. wonder if that's always the case. So the um, position, so the portion of the position constraint, uh, yeah, it requires portion of the position constraint be invertible. And the only real case where that doesn't come in, uh, just based on how that works, is the, uh, let me go back and show you a picture, picture of that actually. So it's actually this, um, this configuration here, uh, if this, if you got this, uh, the snake into this configuration, that's not quite invertible because the, um, uh, because you, you have a free motion where you can rotate the, um, the, uh, cent the centers of constraint for uh, three wheel sets converge. So you can rotate this freely around that center of constraint. And so that's a point where it wouldn't be invertible, but it's invertible, uh, almost everywhere. And so you can, uh, and you can work with that and you can special case what happens if you do end up in a constraint like this. Uh, for the uh, systems that are, I more typically work with, um, such as the um, viscous system uh, or the or the inertial freefall system, uh, that um, in that case, the position portion of the constraints are always invertible. Interesting. So one of the um, our participants has asked, thank you for the great lecture. How do you think spiders perform all these fascinating tasks and optimizations, given that they only have 100,000 neurons? Many of these tasks would be quite hard to solve, even on a large modern computer. I don't think I'm uh, qualified to answer that question. I have not um, worked with the uh, spider uh, neural system. But um, I will say that for the specific um, web localization things that we're looking at, I think that um, if there exists, uh, like the uh, comparative algorithm that we're using of uh, looking for similar time domain signals uh, between feet, I think something like that could work um, uh, could work fairly cleanly with relatively low computation and. Uh, but I'm not. But I'm not sure on the bigger question of how spiders uh, are able to so efficiently use their uh, neurons. Thank you. And I think we have time for just one final question. And and that question is: Do you have any examples of motions which are not theoretically or practically possible? Um. Sorry. Could you repeat the question, please? Sure. It's, do you have any examples of motions which are not theoretically or practically possible? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure about that. So the, um, so in order to be theoretically, po so there be, so I guess not theoretically or practically possible uh, would be things like uh, if you're trying, trying to travel in space, Without having any reaction mass, you couldn't travel like that. I'm not. I'm not, I'm not sure uh, what the questioner is going for there. Well, thank you for your for your answer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, everyone, uh, that concludes our session today. Thank you so very much, Dr. Hatton, for your presentation and your answers to all of our questions. And thank you to all of my ACO colleagues who have helped us uh, put this event together. To all of you who have joined us today, we very much appreciate your interest and we invite you to watch our social media feeds for information about future sessions. As a reminder, our next session will be on August 29th with a presentation from Dr. Yang Tong Shi from the University of Alberta. And her presentation is entitled Understanding the uh, Predicting Ice Processes in Northern Rivers. In the meantime, please stay safe and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.